Hey friends. <laughs> yeah, this is a look. <laughs> but stick with me. So here's the thing. I have been dreaming about uh, this particular project for a long time. And yeah, I'm in the middle of baking cookies, but I've been working on this all day long for you. So stick with me. I'm going to give you a hint. This is kind of a holiday project. So there's your first hint. Your second hint is raindrops on roses. Ooh, a little pitchy there. Anyway, do you know what we're going to do today? So I love favorite things. The Sound of Music is my all time favorite movie. I could watch it again and again and again, and I have like a thousand times. And it gives me such peace and calm. I have it playing in the background when I'm cooking or whatever, cleaning. So I've been wanting to turn this song into a holiday wreath watercolor project. So now don't run away, because I know it's like, whoa. That's a lot, that's a big undertaking. And it is, uh, and it could be stressful, but not with me, nuh -uh, no. I'm gonna show you two techniques that I'm gonna use more than anything else during this painting session, keeping it simple. I'm also gonna show you a couple of watercolor hacks that you can use when you inevitably are gonna feel like, oh, this isn't coming together, this is messy, this is crazy, because I know, because I felt that way when I was trying to wrap up this project for you. So a couple of hacks to kind of bring things to life and just make your painting feel super successful really quickly. So I have one question for you. Do you want to sing? I, I mean, paint with me. <laughs> All right, come on, let's go. Okay, here we go, friends. Today we're using Academy. I seem to be using Academy all the time. And I just love this paper. And when you buy it on Amazon, it comes with that little leaf to remove the pages from your block. And of course, a pencil. I'm using an HB pencil today. I do have an eraser on hand and the Art for Joy Sake brush collection. Let me talk about an eraser a little bit because you never see me use one and I rarely do. This is a Stedler eraser. Head down to the information section below and you can see where I get this. I love Stedler erasers. They don't leave a residue. They're fantastic. So the brushes, I'm going to use every single one of these brushes today in different ways. So I'm giving you a little mini tour of them. I adore them. So many of you have them and are enjoying them just the same. And you can also get information on those below. And my favorite palette, it's a handmade watercolor palette from a company called Case for Making. Now we are gonna take a plate. I just happen to be using a simple Christmas plate anything that will fit your paper and trace a circle. All right, we are gonna start with raindrops on roses, of course. And I'm basically going to draw a misshapen circle, friends. And, and that is really the best way to describe it. As I draw the circle, I very quickly um, add some little ruffly areas and a sense of the petals as they're swirling around each other. I don't take too long before I go right into my classic teardrop shape, just to the upper right of my rose. And I'm going to then go in with a wet on dry technique where I add some not so clean water. It's okay. I'm going to fill in this loosey goosey ruffly round shape that I created and drop in my favorite fluorescent pink. Friends, fluorescent is definitely going to make a statement in this finished piece, so get ready for it. I'm adding a little bit of a raspberry in the middle. Just mix a red with a little bit of green or a pink with a little bit of green. And then with a clean brush, just spreading and blending very lightly and moving on with a little bit of dark in the center, a dark, dark blue, a purple, an indigo, I would personally stay away from black, but you do you. I'm grabbing the round brush, it's a number two round, and adding a little bit of blue, wet on dry, and then coming back in with a clean, wet brush and blendy blend just a little bit. And there you have it. That's where we're stopping with this piece. We are moving on to whiskers on kittens, friends. I am not someone who paints or draws animals a lot, so I'm gonna keep it simple. Start with a soft edged piece of pizza. That's right, a soft triangle. And then create a little bump out where the cat's cheeks will be. And then two soft edged triangles on either side at the top. 
and then repeat that triangle shape inside and there you have the big ears love this so much and then a big old nose and remember you have that eraser if you need to do a little fixy fix and then eyes now that one they're a little too high so i am going to fix that but you can already see this simple cat take shape and now the cat right at this point is going to feel unfinished it's going to be feel very simplistic but trust me when you get some color on there starting to get the whiskers on there and i am doing the whiskers in pencil because i want that definition because just just to give you a little peek ahead uh, we are going to only be doing basically one or two layers of watercolor and then a layer of detail and that's it for this painting style we're not going to layer and layer and layer and layer until the cows come home all right a little bit of a tan peachy dabs of pink because i want pink cheeks and peak pink inside of the ears and then go in with a clean wet brush and blend all of that around and yes there are going to be parts of this kitty cat's face that are pink that you're probably like should they be pink but don't worry about it you can add a little bit more color a little more brown or cream back in to your wet watercolor to define things a little more i'm going to intensify the pink on that nose and then continue to blend around and essentially blend away some of that pink that made it all over our little feline friend here this one this next element is probably my absolute favorite it's the copper kettle and you're going to start with a boxy circle and you're probably like wait what so start with a just a really lazy circle see how i erased the line that went through what will eventually be my kettle uh, and then go ahead and do a little bit of shaping with your pencil go to the left and the right to create the edges of the kettle and then a little bit of a smiley face at the bottom to create the base of your kettle and then we're going to put a wooden handle you, can, you know those vintage copper kettles they've got that like ceramic handle with wooden inlay well that's kind of where my head's at that's what i'm envisioning here for this one so i'm creating a little handle on top and you can start to see this kettle take shape and then the, honestly the trickiest part of this is the spout and basically it's a very elongated triangle that has a little cut on the edge a little angle on the edge and I'm just going to continue to refine this shape and I've got my topper here I'm going to put a little knob on that soon you'll notice I'm going over some of my original lines expanding them a little bit and that's just how I sketch. I do tend to darken things up a little bit because I know thinking ahead, I'm going to let these pencil lines show through. I'm not going to try to erase these later on. So making these pencil lines a little darker right now is totally okay. Now that was a little too thick. So going in with my eraser. Now friends, the eraser can become a stressful thing for a lot of folks because you can obsess and oh, that's not quite right. Oh, that's not quite right. So I make a promise to myself that I'm only going to erase a particular area about two times maximum before I take a break and get out of there and take a rest. I don't want to be erasing, resketching, erasing, resketching. So two times and get out of there. All right. Now going into painting this little kettle, I'm adding some terracotta. If you don't have a pre-mixed, just do your orange with a little bit of brown or a little bit of purple. And then I'm using various shades of orange, a little bit of fluorescent, uh, a brighter orange, and I'm just dabbing it around wet on dry. And friends, if you're not sure what I mean by this wet on dry, these techniques that I've called out, I want you to watch this video before you fully dive into the one we're in now. Watch this one. It takes you through all of my basic techniques from my perspective. You don't want to miss it so I'm continuing to dab in color here purposely leaving some white areas free so to kind of get that shine because remember we're not going to layer and layer and layer this painting is not going to take us six seven eight plus hours this painting is going to take about 90 minutes so one or two layers on this watercolor and that's that so I know I want to get that shiny vibe on my kettle which means I need to leave a little bit of the white paper showing through because in instantly you can already see it. You've got a little bit of a shine feel going on. Now I'm envisioning that porcelain handle to have like a Delft pattern, like that Dutch, that classic blue and white pattern. So I'm hinting at that. I'm using my number two brush here just to add a little shadow to the metal handle. You really don't even need that. 
absolutely unnecessary if you don't want to get so detailed with that. Moving on. Oh, the mittens. Now, friends, you're probably wondering, like, Christy, did you just do all of this from your memory? I did. I honestly did all of this from my memory. And the more I think about it, I think I drew these mittens backwards. But like, whatever. It's OK. They're still cute. and They still read as mittens. It's basically two ovals. They're nestled next to one another. One of the ovals is kind of underneath the other, so you can't see the full shape. And then at the base of the ovals, I've created a little bump out for the thumb of the mitten. And I am going ahead and erasing that traced circle, adding a little zigzag. And I'm following the pattern across both mittens. Not exactly. I'm not being super, super detailed about it, but I am creating like the zigzag and these stripes across both mittens just so they really kind of take on the vibe that they are a pair of mittens. Notice I'm not pressing too hard at this stage. Wow, do you see the light changing in my video? It is a beautiful morning. I've been filming this, the sun shining into the studio, but man, it is, the light is just changing so rapidly. So thanks for sticking with me. Just know that when that light change on, changes on screen, it means sun is pouring happily into my studio. Adding a little bit of red, you use your favorite red, just dabbing it into a couple of places. Okay, I'm going to take that wet on my brush, no more color on my brush at this point, and smooth out to fill in those zigzags I have just sketched in. Fill in the thumbs a little bit. Now, this could feel a lot like coloring because I sketched first and now I'm painting into my sketch. But don't feel like you have to fill everything in perfectly. I'm going to be going over a couple of techniques later on that are going to really button up this painting that's got a lot going on. You're going to have moments in this painting that feel like they need a little something, something. And I've got that for you. But at this stage, don't be terribly hard on yourself about filling everything in perfectly and staying perfectly within the lines that you've sketched. I promise you it will all come together. We are not going to panic. I know this feels like a lot. There are so many different elements to this project, but trust me, there are ways to recover all the little imperfections that you are seeing, that I'm seeing in my own artwork. And I think it's important that we don't just run away from a complicated project because we can't, or we don't think we can do it justice and do it perfectly because there's so many ways to be successful. There isn't just one way. Brown paper packages tied up with string. <laughs> you knew I wasn't going to be able to refrain from breaking out into song for too long. One of my favorite lines, love the brown paper packages. Um, and this is a little cluster. This is going to be a somewhat of a focal point of this wreath. And don't worry, later on, we're going to be filling in areas with greenery to really bring home the leaf, not the leaf, the wreath vibe, bring it home really strong. So right now I know you're like, oh my gosh, there's just all these parts, Christy, I don't get it. But trust me, it'll all come together. So I'm creating a simple square and a cylinder. And then I'm going to wrap this little cluster up with a round. Imagine, you know, that movie. Oh, my gosh. Uh, a Christmas story where uh, Ralphie's dad gets the bowling ball and it was wrapped in wrapping paper. Well, I, I kind of thinking about that wrapped bowling ball for my third package that I'm going to sketch here soon. But if you want a refresher on how to sketch um, a cube and a cylinder, you can Google that. Super simple, but basically a bunch of parallel lines and you've got it. You can always rewind this and watch how I did it. Mine is not perfect, not perfect, but this is whimsical. This is fun. This is um, kind of has that like quirky, imperfect feel, this illustration style. So we don't have to be super exacting. Here comes that bowling ball wrapped in paper. Just imagine there's a bowling ball in here. So lazy circle with a little scratchy, ruffly, sketchy moment on top. I am sketching in some of the packages tied up with the string at this point, but I'll be painting in the detail of the string later. So don't worry too much about that. Grabbing my quarter inch dagger and just dabbing in some tan. So a light brown. If you don't have a premix light brown, just use brown and water it down and just 
kind of rough in that brown color and as you'll see soon we'll be adding some other colors a little smidge of terracotta there a little too much paint on my brush so I dabbed off screen on a paper towel and I'm using just the tip of this dagger brush friends if you're curious about my brush collection more you see me work with it all the time take a look at this video I think you'll enjoy it it'll give you a really fun simple quick overview of what my brushes are all about if you're curious all right using a clean damp brush and I'm just spreading the browns around these three packages this is a little bit more smooth than say the copper kettle but by design I'm thinking about that craft paper that you wrap with and it is very matte very even color Taking a dark brown here, if you don't have a pre-mixed dark brown, you could literally mix together blue, purple, red, and green, and you're going to get something that looks a little dark brown. And I'm just using touches of that dark brown on edges of the packages and letting it blend, blend out, using it along. I'm not outlining per se, but right now the page is damp, so I'm taking the wet brown color into the damp page and it's diffusing instantly, which is giving such a lovely soft effect. If you took that dark brown right onto a dry page, if you let that brown underneath dry first, you're gonna get a much stronger effect. So just keep that in mind, that if you want an instant diffusing of the color that you're adding, make sure things are a little damp or wet underneath. So fun, so pretty, oh my gosh. All right, I did a little horseshoe there, friends, because I am not sketching no cream colored pony. I, no, I can't do it. I don't wanna do it. Okay, I broke my own rules. I said can't. I don't want to sketch a pony. So I sketched a quick horseshoe, thinking to myself, well, Christy, that is perfect to represent a pony. Because you know what? I knew that trying to sketch that pony would steal my joy. And I'm not in the mood to have my joy stolen during this fun painting session. So. On to the crisp apple strudel. I sketched a little apple, basically just a little slightly wonky circle with a little teardrop leaf shape on the top. And then the strudel, you could Google some strudel images. It's basically like a rounded edged rectangle with a few like little air pockets or openings at the top. I'm adding in some red and immediately zhuzhing and smooshing and blending it around with clean water. I'm using the cat's tongue brush, the very tip of it. I'm going right in so it's wet on wet now, probably more like wet on damp. And I'm using just the tip of the cat's tongue with some bright red, freshly loaded on that brush and adding in a little bit of detailing in areas. This is a technique I call contrast detailing. Remember, you can watch the ultimate guide to beginner's watercolor here if you wanna know more about these techniques specifically. And yes, I did drop in a little fluorescent pink because I'm a crazy like that. And here we are into the strudel and I'm going in with a slight fluorescent orange. I'm purposely letting some of that pink just trickle down into the strudel. I know many of you tell me, Christy, your color choices just completely baffle me. I always can't wait to watch what, what you do and how it turns out. Stick with me. I promise we're not gonna have a pink strudel. I promise. All right, already going in with a little bit of dark brown, the tip of that cat's tongue, and just dabbing in some dark brown and then immediately blending it out to soften it. I'm slowly building the color on this strudel. Going in with a little bit, I have a lovely convenience color. I call it's like a creamy color. Um, so I added a little bit of that, a little bit of a terracotta. Remember, terracotta is just a bright orange mixed with brown and lovely. All right, now I got my packages dried and I'm ready to tie these bad boys up with some string and you know I'm bringing out the liner brush because um, <laughs> what else would I use but a liner brush to create some string. Now you know how I hold my brush. I'm sorry my hand is blocking things, still working on that, but I am almost perpendicular to the page with the liner brush fully loaded with a lovely red. It's perfectly loaded. It's not too much pigment. It's not too much water. You don't wanna see a bubble 
of pigment or water on the end of that liner brush before you hit the page with it. If you do have any size little bubble on the end of that liner brush, it's gonna be too much and you're gonna get a very thick line you probably won't be too thrilled with. So practice getting the right amount of color on that brush. I hate to say right, but you know what I mean. You know what you want out of this brush and you want thin, wispy, lovely lines. If this part makes you nervous, go ahead on a piece of practice paper and do a little practicing, creating these thin lines and see how you feel about it before you come on to this final piece and do what you need to do. Notice I'm not feeling the need to create the loops of this string, these ribbons in one stroke. That could be stressful. That actually is a little more difficult, technically speaking. So I'm making these little, these little ribbon bubbles, these little ribbon loops, almost slightly pointed. They still totally look like ribbon, string, whatever you want to call it, thread, twine but a little bit easier to execute than creating that perfectly arced swoop. Now, if you want the perfectly arced swoop like I have in the first package here on the left, like I said, take a little practice moment on a scratch piece of paper and you will feel that much more confident getting the perfect swoop. And notice uh, an important thing here is just a little dot at the center where all of the loops converge. You want a more obvious dot of that color there. It just gives the visual punch that you need for these ribbons, twine, whatever you want to call it to look more convincing. Yes, there is a little bit of fluorescent mixed in. As I've gone from left to right, painting these ribbons, I've started adding a little bit of fluorescent because I want there to be, I mentioned it earlier, fluorescent to be something that happens in this painting here and there because it just enlivens things. It takes a traditional song and interprets it in a really fun and current way. All right, moving on to that doorbell. I googled vintage doorbell and I chose the first one I saw. I didn't spend a lot of time obsessing over it. And basically it is the same shape, top and bottom, one is mirroring the other. So decide what shape you wanna sketch out on the top and just mirror it on the bottom. And a little dot in the middle. But again, you might wanna do a different doorbell. This one, I don't know if I would do this again. This is when I showed this to my husband, to my dad, and my mom. They were like, oh, what's that? I'm like, ah, it's a doorbell. But you know what? It's okay. It's an interest. It's an interesting part of the painting that people are going to talk about because they're not sure what it is. But maybe you have a better doorbell image. And if you do, hit me up in comments. Let me know what image you use to inspire your doorbell for this painting. Now I'm going on wet on dry with a beautiful medium yellow. If you only have a super duper bright lemon yellow, just add a smidge of orange to what you have or a smidge of brown, um, even a smidge of purple, you'll have a lovely medium yellow. Now I'm going in with an orange and a terracotta, a light brown, and I'm just dabbing, creating some arc shapes with the tip of my quarter inch dagger, starting to define, add a little shadow around the doorbell right in the middle, but it's all shades of yellow, orange, brown, terracotta, everything in between. As the yellow underneath that first layer is starting to dry, the color that I'm adding is becoming more intense. And that's kind of by design. So if you want more intense detailing shadows, wait for your first layer of watercolor to dry a little bit longer. I wouldn't recommend in this painting for letting your first layer to dry completely because you want that kind of soft blend, the diffused look that you're getting from the wet on damp that I'm showing you right now. And then I'm going right in with the tip of my dagger brush, not a very wet brush, it's kind of a drier brush with a dark indigo, so a dark blue. If you don't have a dark blue, take a blue and mix it with brown, purple, anything dark you have to create super duper dark color. And you're done. Now notice I let left a little bit of a white edge between my doorbell button and kind of the brass of the decorative area of the doorbell because I didn't want the colors to bleed out of control. Hey friends, if you are still with me, oh, I know, this might just be the longest video I've ever 
gone with on YouTube. I couldn't believe how much footage I had, but you know what? I went with it because I felt like so many of you out there lately have been asking me for more in-depth instruction. And I was like, you know what? People got some time off coming up for the holidays. Sorry if you're watching this, not during the season when it was first uploaded. Maybe you have some time coming up where you can spend, you can give yourself a couple of hours to sit down and immerse yourself in this experience. And I hope that is the case. All right, we are moving on to the sleigh bell. You know, I have a silly story about sleigh bells. As a child, we had sleigh bells hanging on our door all year round. And my dad, I didn't realize, I thought it was Santa, but he, every night he'd put me to bed. And then all of a sudden I would hear the sleigh bells ringing. And at the beginning of December, the sleigh bells would be super quiet and every night they'd get a little bit louder. So I just love sleigh bells. I have them all over my house. Every room has a different style of sleigh bell that I've collected over the years. So starting with that brass ring at the top, just a simple circle. If you don't feel conf confident with circles, uh, trace something, trace something small, little cap, whatever it may be, the inside of your ring. And then basically you've got three sections that are a version of a circle, an unfinished circle. And you're going to create this kind of like hourglass and essentially is that is the shape it's an hourglass with an extra bump and then inside of that you're going to have your three bells now you're going to see here i experiment with how i want to style my bells with what kind of detailing i want but i don't like it i i i didn't feel like it looked like a sleigh bell so I did this from memory. I did not Google a sleigh bell image because I love sleigh bells. I figured I know what they look like. So I decided to Google the sleigh bells and realized that they kind of have this band, this belly, this belt, if you will, across the middle. And so I'm going to go ahead and erase that and create that little belly band, whatever, across the middle. And I'm getting a much more authentic sleigh bell vibe. Notice now that I'm feeling more confident in the shapes, I am going ahead and pressing a little harder with my pencil. Don't feel like you need to press hard with your pencil. You absolutely don't have to. And another iconic detail with the sleigh bells is that little air hole at the bottom. Um, and you've got something that really feels authentic and it works. We're gonna load up our number two round brush with a bright red and we're gonna dab it along the edges in areas. Go back with a somewhat clean brush filled with water and blend out. This is wet on dry and you're blending out with just clean water. You're not adding any new color right now, not yet. Blend, 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 lovely blend and see that you're getting instant highs and lows because you put that intense color only in a few areas and now we're blending out from the intense color with clean water. Lovely. Feel free to go ahead and load up that brush with a little more color if you wanna start further refining the shape, adding additional shadows. I already feel like I'm getting a little too dark and I feel like I'm overworking a little, but you know what, it's okay, it's okay. Don't get nervous. Now, I just wanna remind you, friends, that towards the end of this video, I'm gonna show you two specific watercolor hacks for how do I want to say this? For covering up mistakes, for covering up and camouflaging and making um, missteps in your painting look fantabulous. Fantastic. Okay. Because I don't want you sitting here stressing. I know that this is overwhelming. I know I stressed about taking on this painting project because I was like, how many elements are there in this song? And they're all things that I don't necessarily paint on a regular basis. Um, like only one of them's a flower. Hello. I am so out of my comfort zone, but I love this song. And my heart just kept telling me, Christy, figure this out, paint this wreath paint favorite things, figure it out. And so I realized that I was going to have to go easy on myself. And I wasn't going to try to be uh, creating a hyper realistic version of the sleigh bell and the schnitzel and the, the, the blue sash and all the things that, that my approach to this painting in order to preserve my sanity and actually enjoy the experience was going to need to be more loosey goosey with some hacks at the end to bring it all together. So Stay with me and let's move on to the schnitzel. We're going to create an oval 
And then we're gonna create four smaller ovals that kind of overlap. Those are kind of your, what are they, veal? It's like veal cutlets, I think, is schnitzel? I don't know, somebody tell me the truth. And then just a little bumpy pile, it almost looks like a cloud outline, and that's going to be our noodles. And I'm gonna erase that circle that I traced to guide me along the way in my wreath. Some people like to use a clean brush to swipe away their eraser shavings. Eh, you know, because the oils of your fingers can get into the paper and all the things, but I don't do that. Okay, number two brush. I'm gonna use a green. I'm thinking about, I've got a lot of pinks, a lot of fluorescents, a lot of browns. I need some other colors. So I'm going in with a lovely like turquoise green. If you don't have a pre-mixed turquoise, just take your favorite green, add a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow, you'll be golden. Same kind of idea where I'm laying down some more intense color in areas and then using a damp, clean brush and blending around and filling in the whole plate. And there you have it. You're probably thinking, gosh, do I really want to paint food? Uh, and it could be fun. You know, it, it is schnitzel my favorite thing ever to paint uh, no, but every once in a while uh, to paint something silly like this is freeing. And so give it a try. All right, a light brown here. Um, I'm being careful not to go right up against the green because remember, we're, we're taking on this painting quickly. So I'm not fully letting things dry. So I'm giving some space between the green and the brown just a little bit with a light touch. You go in heavy handed and you bump into a wet area in your painting. It's going to just, everything's going to start to explode. You go in with a light touch, leave a little bit of breathing room, you're gonna be in wonderful shape. All right, the noodles is just a lighter version of the brown, lots more water and get that on paper. And then I'm immediately going in with the tip of my number two and adding in a darker brown. And I'm dabbing, I'm not filling in all of these cutlets with that darker brown. I'm creating like the idea that there's a breading on this with very simple strokes of color going around the edges in areas not to outline with my darkest brown, but just to add a little bit of shading in areas. This is another very small scale example of contrast detailing. And then with a slightly, slightly darker brown, I'm going to add some detail to the noodles. Now my noodle area is <laughs> damp. So the details that I added diffused instantly for a nice soft touch. Going in with my darker green, it's kind of like a Kelly green, just your classic brighter green. And in areas dabbing in some stronger green for shadow. And your schnitzel is done. Now, I, I told you I felt like these sleigh bells were overworked and I wasn't wrong. Ugh, just a lot of heavy red. I, the red is very, uh, it's a staining color. Certain watercolors stain the paper. So what that means is once they hit the paper, they soak right in and they don't they don't lend themselves to being lifted out very easily. As you can see, I'm adding clean water. I'm scrubbing a little bit and dabbing with my paper towel, but it's just not coming up. So you know what I do? I take a fluorescent, I take a bold move and I dab some fluorescent in there to just brighten things up. Just another reason why I love fluorescents and why you need to give them a second look. Can you believe we're here? We're, we're coming up on it. We're coming up on it. The wild geese goose wild goose that flies with a moon on her wings and now i have to sketch the wild goose oh my gosh so a very elongated oval and a very soft skinny triangle leading up to another elongated teeny tiny oval for the head of the goose and create just a shape on top of that oval that feels like a wing to you it doesn't have to be something perfectly wing-like, okay? Um, I used my eraser just a little bit there because I wanted to give a little more thought to what I needed that wing to look like. Google an image of a goose or just follow mine. I think that my goose shape was pretty successful. Um, so you can just see what I do here, pause, rewind, and recreate, try to recreate that yourself. Just keep in mind that the biggest, broadest part of the goose is that midsection, his belly, that long elongated oval. And then of course, this kind of arcing strong shape that comes up from the top over the back of the goose, which is his wing. 
And, uh, you know, I tried this moon freehand. I wasn't feeling it. So I grabbed the cap of my gesso container and I traced it ultimately. You see me erasing here. I ultimately am going to be like, uh-uh, no, I'm going to trace it. So don't let parts of this painting steal your joy. Remember the cream colored pony, friends. That pony wanted to steal my joy in this painting. So go ahead and trace where you can. Go ahead and cheat a little where you can to preserve your joy. You want to be having fun. If you're not feeling like this is fun, take a breath and figure out if there's something that you can do to simplify. Rules be damned. And what ifs, how should I, should I do this? Be damned. Trace if you want to. Eliminate something if you want to. If you're recreating this along with me and you're like, I do not want to draw a goose. Skip the goose, friend. Skip the goose. It's okay. All right. Enough waxing poetic about a goose and a pony. Moving on. I, I really loved this goose. I surprised myself here and I'm so glad I gave myself the space to surprise myself. So I'm hoping that you do the same. I know so many of you are probably just watching along with me first. So I encourage you continue watching, but I want you to paint with me eventually. I'm using my half inch dagger going right in with my creamy color. If you don't have a creamy color, just water down a brown and then almost immediately going in with a very dark brown touched with a little bit of indigo or a blue um, to give some darkness, some immediate intensity to the top of that wing going in with that same dark color. And I am literally just filling in the neck of this goose. There's this color, this darkness of the goose is so important and really is iconic and is so important in making this goose shape and vibe come to life. Did you know that a goose could have a vibe? <laughs> I didn't. Anyway, a little bit of that darkness on the underbelly. And let's get a little bit of yellow in here for this moon. Just a, a medium yellow. I'm Remember, everything is wet or damp here in this goose town. Uh, so don't get, see, don't get too close to that dark wing because see how that bled out a little bit, adding a little orange just for, just for interest. I'm taking the tip of my dagger in the meantime, and just creating a few stripes, pulling down from the darkness of the wing through the underbelly, just a few little stripey strokes to create some shape. Can you believe it? You painted a goose. Mm-hmm. Friends, are you having a good time? I hope so. If you are, I would love for you to become part of this community. Hit that subscribe button. I upload twice a week and I don't want you to miss any of it. Uh, and of course, if you are having fun and you're in inspired and excited, hit the like button because there are others out there who I'm thinking probably need to be inspired and excited about watercolor as well. So thank you so much. All right, we're moving on to that blue sash. And the song goes, how does the song go? Um, the, the girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes. Well, I didn't feel like drawing a girl per se. So I am gonna use this blue sash as a real uh, focal point right around my rose. And I'm just going to create the tails and the little loops of a sash and get in there with juicy blue watercolor and let it just become a focal point. So we don't need the little girl. If you wanna sketch little girl, if uh, figure sketches are your jam, by all means, because you know, cream ponies are probably your jam too. So your painting's going in a whole different lovely direction than mine. But for me, I'm creating this, this gorgeous kind of sweeping area at the bottom right around the kitty cat and the rose. And I'm just gonna add two little tails here, longer tails, and then I'm gonna go up right on top of the rose and do short, short tails and a few loops. This is something you're probably like, Christy, I don't know how to sketch a ribbon. And really think about a ribbon like a banner. If you Google just a banner image on Google, <laughs> you essentially are drawing a banner that has kind of shape to it, that has a wave to it. So it's not a straight banner, it's a wavy kind of wonky 
banner. So think about it that way. I'm going in with my three quarter inch flat wash brush from the Art for Joy Sake brush collection. I'm going right in with dark blues. I've already laid down two or three blues here and I'm, I've got my brush almost perpendicular to the page so I can use that thin skinny edge of the brush that'll give me a lot of definition in a smaller area, but I'm also able to cover more area because the brush is bigger. So it, this brush forces me to not be terribly precious about areas that I know, I know of myself that I could get too particular about. And so this um, sash, this blue is very, very damp right now. It's a great time to add in more intense blues. If you have a fluorescent blue, have at it, friends. This is the time to add it. Don't spend too much time here. This sash, you could get into this crazy loop of trying to perfect the sash's shape because you've made up you've made up this sash. You have no reference point besides my painting or maybe a Google image. Don't get hung up and continually, continually trying to perfect the shape of these loops and the sash. Get something down. If you wanna make a few little changes, erase up to two times and then move on, get some paint on there, take a breath and then see how you feel about it. That loop right there, that's pretty. I could obsess over that loop that I just sketched. I feel it in my gut. I wanna obsess over it a little bit, but instead I'm gonna go ahead, add some more color to my other little sash lengths here and try to not worry about being a perfectionist about that loop. Uh, when this color is damp on the sash, if you want some more highlights, you want it to feel more satin, you want an, an effect more like the copper kettle, uh, you could lift some of the color here. And lifting is basically taking a clean, damp brush, adding water to an area, and then pulling the color off, lifting the color off and blotting it on a paper towel, rinse and repeat. Um, but also one of my hacks later on is going to give you a lovely shine on this ribbon, this sash. So you can also just not worry about it till then. I'm going into this loop with a very, very dark indigo and I'm already, already loving the shape better. And I didn't need to obsess over the sketch of that shape to be in love with it because the paint handled it for me. So sometimes you've got to you've got to let your painting breathe a little before you obsess about an area. As you're obsessing about an area, realize that maybe you just need to step back, take a breath, work on another section and come back to it. All right, I decided to add another little small loop there because it just felt right. It felt like I, a way to make that area more interesting. And oddly enough, um, I didn't sketch those little last minute additions. So I'm going in with my pencil after the fact and adding a little quick um, uneven outline because I want everything to kind of flow. I want that style, that outline pencil visible style to be obvious throughout the whole painting. Friends, I'm gonna give you a little peek at the hack that we've got coming up in more depth at the uh, end of this video. I'm using a little bit of gesso on my brush. I'm using the half inch dagger and going into the damp watercolor and just lightening things up slightly. So yes, friends, this isn't a quote pure, quote, traditional watercolor. It is becoming a mixed media. What is mixed media? It's basically just that. You're mixing together different types of art supplies in one painting. So we've got watercolor, we've got pencil, and now we've got gesso. All right, now we need to get on to the winter scene. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do here, so I just dove in. I tried not to overthink it. Um, I'm going in with an indigo and the curved edge of my half inch dagger and I'm creating kind of this cloudy nighttime, hopefully eventually a winter sky. I wanted this this scene, the sky to coincide with and be next to my goose flying over the moon. It's not going to be to scale, obviously, for the goose. But nothing in this holiday favorite things wreath is to scale, if you haven't noticed. Scale is not important here. This is an imaginary world that you're creating, so no worries. So I'm going in with that dark indigo. Lovely, lovely. 
watering it down just a little bit to create a little bit of foreground, little horizon line. I'm not really sure what I'm doing here. I'm just going with it. Um, I can tell you, obviously, because I already know how this turns out, right? <laughs> this is not one of my favorite parts in the painting. But I didn't let it stress me out. I'm adding some trees here with a very dark green and the tip of the half inch dagger. I honestly wish, you see this point right here? This is a, a, good, a good thing to bring up. The point of this little section right now is that I wish I ha had left it like it is right now even before those marks, even now, right there. It's, it's so pretty right here. It almost looks like winter in Yosemite, okay? But I continued to obsess and go crazy and add, you see, add snow and things just got overworked. But when I was all said and done, it wasn't a focal point and I didn't get super upset about it. I didn't let it ruin my experience. So you will see me continue to work and overwork this section. Um, but just remember that point where I said, I wished I would have left it like this because we can come back to that and we can learn from it. I'll tell you friends what, on this channel, I like to call out my own mistakes. I don't hide behind the fact. I don't try to make it uh, seem like I'm always painting something glorious and beautiful and perfect and lovely and effortless because it's not that way. But the point is, is that we can still find joy through all of that mess that is our creative journey. So that's why I like to call out these overworked frustration moments. So I would love for you to share. If you have an aha moment after watching this, something that I've said or done or a part, some, the way I've painted something, if you've had an aha moment so far, would you share that in the comments? Because I want others to know that this community, we're here, we're working on this thing together. And I want you to know what other people are experiencing, what their aha moments are, and we can read them all and we can learn from each other. So go ahead below, comment, and let me know what what your moment has been so far. All right. And while you're at it, go ahead and make sure you subscribe and give this video a boop, which is a like. All right. All right. Now you see as I, all that talking, all that talking, and I am still fussing with this winter scene. Mm hmm. I am still fussing. It's blizzard. It's a blizzard. I've created a, um, a very, very messy blizzard in Yosemite. Uh, the trees have disappeared. You can't see them because it's a blizzard. <laughs> Anywho, let's move on to the snowflakes. I love these. A light blue on your brush, create a plus sign, then create a star. And that's basically the baseline of your snowflake. And then we're going to take a darker blue and we're going to dab that on the tips. I'm going to dab it in the middle. Those lines that you first laid down, friends, they are wet. So as you dab, they're going to slowly diffuse that darker color out and about and things are going to spread a little bit. Now, I'm using the liner brush, of course, because I want that, that detail, that refinement of a thinner line. And I am now refining out from the center. See that? This is going to be my biggest snowflake. So I'm spending a little more time on this one. You see how I'm slowly, slowly refining that shape and building that center out to the tips. And I'm going to add a little bit more dark blue now that I've got more surface area on the snowflake that is wet. And look at that. Isn't that lovely? And I know it kind of looks like a jacks. Is that what they're called? Those toys from, from the 50s? Jacks? I don't know. Whatever. Pick up sticks? No, that's not right. Anyway, but it's okay. It definitely feels and communicates as a snowflake. So if you Googled snowflakes, you're going to get all those kind of classic snowflakey shapes that kind of feel very like second grade, uh, which isn't a bad thing. I'm not judging second grade snowflakes, but I wanted something a little more grown up, something a little more whimsical and stylized. So I'm going to continue on here. Soft blue, create just this kind of star like burst of lines. And I'm just going to continue that same technique. Sometimes I'm adding more lines. Sometimes I'm using less. Um, smaller snowflakes, larger snowflakes. You want a larger snowflake, just create longer lines. Start with that plus sign and make it bigger and build out from there. So we're just going to continue on here. A beautiful little cluster of snowflakes. Now these snowflakes, if you're loving them, I would encourage you to add them elsewhere in this wreath. They could definitely be a perfect filler detail. I didn't do that. I used greenery. You'll see where we're going with that. 
uh, as my filler, but snowflakes could certainly be a lovely filler as an alternative to a lot of greenery. All right, friends, are you still with me? This is a long one. I told you, this is a <laughs> long one. Now, here I go back into this winter scene. Now, I know I've lost my trees. And again, I'm I'm taking you through this frustration moment with me for a reason. So I'm going back in with my liner brush. Um, this scene has dried a bit. So I know that if I lay down a super, super dark color with details, it's going to pop more and it's going to give me back that definition that I feel that I've lost there. And I'm going to let that dry. I'm not going to fuss with it more because we know what happens when we fuss we know what happens all right silver white winters are melting into spring yes so to me spring is tulip so i decided to use tulips as kind of my iconic spring moment and so i'm basically creating an upside down teardrop repeated overlapped three or four of them hanging downwards though this tulip is is kind of at its prime so you know what happens to tulips when they're at their prime they kind of bend and sculpt themselves into lovely graceful arcs and so I'm going in now with a few shades of green and the number two brush so I can maintain some control um, over this little tulip and uh, using a dark green right down the center of that largest, longest, tallest leaf, and then along the underbelly of these other tulip leaves, and you have instant shadow, instant depth. Friends, the watercolor palette that I'm using, just a note, is by nature. It's a handmade watercolor palette. If you wanna know more about it, head down to the section below. It is a more opaque watercolor set. This uh, brand is very open about the fact that they create more opaque watercolors. Not as opaque as uh, gouache, but still more opaque. So just something to keep in mind. I'm using my liner brush and uh, just defining that stem a little bit with a very dark green and adding a few little whimsical sketched linear moments, leaves and detailing. And I'm sorry my hand is over the area uh, again it gives you a sense though of how exactly I'm holding my brush. I tend to hold my brush down further on the handle and I often hold the brush very much perpendicular. Okay, friends, I know you've been waiting for this moment. Some of you may have fast forwarded to be like, okay, Christy, where is this going? Can we see a view of the whole thing? Well, here you have it, friends. Here is a view of where we're at. So the reason I've zoomed out is because number one, I want you to get a sense of the composition as it stands right now. And number two, this is the second layer. I'm going in with my liner brush. In the mittens here, I've got a little bit of a darker green on my brush. Mix your green with a little bit of blue, with a little bit of brown, uh, mostly green though, and add a few little dots, dashes, um, linear shapes to create a little bit of texture in your mittens. And I'm going and doing the same, mixing up a little bit of a darker orange and adding a few linear details, a little lines, a few dashes, a few dots. This is, I'm going to do this over the entire wreath. All of my elements are going to get a, a layer of detailing with this liner brush. So that is what we're working on now. And what this does, this is the moment where you can take all of these elements and these elements, the only reason they have any relationship to one another is because of this song. So right now, all of these elements, the mittens, the apple, the tulip, the packages, the rose and on and on and on, they look a little disconnected, right? Well, by adding this layer of detail, so going into the copper kettle and adding some darker orange detailing to the kettle, adding some darker blue details to that porcelain handle. I'm going into the sash right now and adding some darker linear details and in an indigo blue to the sash. And I've sped up this portion of the video because I want you to see um, that I can quickly and efficiently go over this whole wreath with just a little bit of detailing on each item. Don't let yourself get too, too focused on any one element. Bounce around this wreath, add that last layer of detailing, and you will start to feel like this is coming together. Love it. All right, friends, remember that liner brush 
It has a long, long bristles. Don't be scared of it though. Liner brushes give you more control than you would think. You just have to loosen your wrist up a little bit. Now, if you want to practice, if you feel like you need some, some drills, some exercises, you want to warm up that hand with a particular brush, watch this video. Take a moment, take a beat, take a pause and watch this video because while I'm not using the liner brush in this video, this is going to show you a great way to warm up with one brush. So go ahead, give it a try and come back and you're going to feel that much more confident using this brush and adding in these details. All right, friends, it's time to add the greenery. It's time. We've got to fill in these areas. We've got to fill in the white space. We've got to connect these seemingly uh, completely unconnected elements with one another. So this is the time to step back, take a breath, look at what you've done. Try to start to think about the areas that you want to tuck in some greenery. And uh, we're going to get to it. I'm going to be using the three quarter inch flat wash brush. Um, and just wait, just wait till you see how this is done. So grab your flat wash brush, pick up two or three greens at the same time, or just one, and you're going to go perfectly perpendicular and you're going to dab, 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 changing the angle of your brush as you dab, 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 change the angle of the brush. Look at that, how easy and simple that greenery is to lay down when you have the right brush. You're basically using the length of your flat wash brush to create the pine needle. So one pine needle is one dab of the brush. And depending on the angle, how you twist the brush, how you twist your hand, you can start to create that kind of real, more real sense of organic pine boughs. Look at that. I'm just going along, filling in, tucking it in, and creating this just lovely full, fullness that this wreath needed to really start to feel like a wreath. Because when we think wreath, we think greenery, we think holly berries. And trust me, the holly berries are coming. They are coming, friends. All right, friends, I'm gonna give you a closer look here of exactly what I'm doing. You can see I've got a dark red. I'm adding some cross hatching, a few little dots and dashes into the apple. I'm doing the same in the sleigh bells. But notice I'm not getting too overdone. A few little moments here and there on each element is really all you need to start to bring these pieces to life. Here we go. A little bit of a darker golden yellow at the base of the bell, at the top of the bell to give a little bit more shine. I'm following the shape of the bell so it's kind of like a frown and a smile. And yes, guess what for the love? Girls going back to the silver white winter because <laughs> I didn't work on it enough already. Now I've got some of that gesso on my brush and I'm going to add a little snow to these trees, trying not to overwork it, knowing that if I add too much snow um, and essentially the snow is a bunch of little dots and dashes across the trees going vertically or horizontally, excuse me. I know if I add too much of it, my trees are gonna disappear again into the background. I'm adding a few little um, graceful strokes to the foreground to kind of create a sense of like a little hill that's in front of the tree line. I actually really like that part. Very pleased with that part. So what we've got coming now is the holly berries. I am using the uh, number two brush. And this is where I'm really going to hit it with some fluorescence. I'm of course going to be using kind of a classic red. I'm doing clusters of three berries in most places. So just know that I love odd numbers for clusters of things, berries, pods, whatever it may be. Um, and I'm going to go around and around the wreath and I'm going to be adding in little clusters, little trios of berries. I'm going to be using reds fluorescent pinks, fluorescent reddish orange. And these berry clusters, one berry is always the biggest. I try to vary the size of the berries. Now, we're gonna be doing more layers on these berries. So right now you're just trying to rough in with the orange and the red. And you're gonna notice you're going over top of greens, darker colors, so your berries might not feel as vibrant. It's okay, the hacks are coming. If you want to add a little bit of gesso even right now, 
to your berries as you're building up the reds and the oranges and the pinks, by all means, that's going to create some, some brightness. That's going to give you um, a less of a see-through look. So if you're going over top of a green or a blue to add your holly berries, and you add a little touch of gesso in with the watercolor, you're not going to be seeing that green or that darkness underneath, and it's gonna be a lot more satisfying. All right, friends, two watercolor hacks to bring this wreath together. Are you ready? Are you ready for it? Because at this point, you're either feeling completely exhilarated, just beyond belief that you've actually done this. I know that's how I was feeling, but you might also be feeling a little like, oh, I don't know, it just feels a little messy. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna get yourself some gesso, white acrylic or white gouache. Even if you have a white gel pen, friends, they all can work. So in areas that you feel like are dark, go in and add a little shine, a little dot of white, a little dash of white, especially in those berries. If you have an area that you feel is particularly dark but isn't necessarily an area that makes sense to add shine to, add a few dots. It could just be snow. Add a few um, little speckles of white from the tip of your brush with that gesso or that acrylic or add a few little swirls of white from your white gel pen to a dark area. This is my secret to you. Yes, it turns your painting into mixed media. No, your painting is no longer a pure watercolor, but friends, does it matter if you are having a good time? Does it matter that you are breaking with tradition if you are filling up with joy and excitement? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. So grab that gesso, pour it on a plate, fill up that liner brush and get to some shine. Add your shine, friends. Add your dots, add your dashes. Think about little moments like on the sleigh bell, you could add a little stitching with a little bit of white on your brush. You could add a few linear details to the rows with the white, not a heavy, heavy white, just a little bit, just a little bit. You could add a little, little glisten to the cat's eyes with just a dot of white, boom, boom. All right, friends, I think you get it. I think you get that there's magic to be had and to happen when you bring gesso into the picture. My second hack, and friends, I'm just explaining these hacks to you as you're watching how I'm using them. I'm not specifically telling you exactly where to place the gesso or exactly where to place the next medium that I'm about to share with you. You've already used it. You've already used it on this painting, friends, and that's pencil. Bring back the pencil, my dear, dear friends. Bring back the pencil. Just like there were areas that felt too dark, there might be areas that feel like they're just washing out. Bring back the pencil and add a little sketchy moment here and there. Um, I love that spot under the kettle where there's some darkness that, that just was begging to happen, so I added it with my pencil. I'm going into the mittens and adding a few more dashes and darkness. I'm, I'm intensifying some of those zigzags. I am creating a few little shading moments where I just kind of scratch my pencil back and forth slowly over a section and that creates a shading effect where it's kind of just a soft, a softness from dark to light that you can create with your pencil. Just a lovely, lovely little hack to refine, to edit, to define at the end of a painting. And there will be teachers that tell you this is cheating. There will be teachers that tell you this isn't pure watercolor. And they can have those opinions, but you can have yours too. And I am telling you that this is valid. This, this hack, the gesso and the pencil at the end of a painting, it has become a signature of mine. It is something that I do in artwork all the time, artwork that I sell and license all over the world. So let your cheats, let your hacks serve you and serve your joy. Go back and forth. You don't have to just do all of the glisten with the white gesso or your gel pens and then do all of the pencil. Work back and forth. Whatever feels right, whatever feels good in the moment is what I want you to do. I'm going into the uh, mittens now, even with a little bit of white. And notice how the detail, even though there's only a couple of layers of watercolor on these pieces of this wreath, the detail is really starting to just jump off the page, right? I love it. Going into that doorbell, same thing. 
pencil, a little bit of shine. The berries are a place that I'm really spending some time with shine and with pencil detailing because I feel like those berries are a lovely way to kind of, it's a compositional thing. The berries guide the viewer's eyes around the wreath. What do I mean by that? Every time someone sees that bright berry that's nicely defined with pencil that has a lovely little dot of shine or a little dash of a glisten, every time they see that element, they know it's time to move their eye along. And there's those repeat, repetitive elements like that in a painting are so powerful to really uh, keep the viewer's eyes moving around and around and to not get bored. So you're gonna see me concentrating on those berries a lot. I'm, uh, You know it, I'm back to the silver white winter section and I'm making my last attempt to define with some gesso and with some pencil here. As I've mentioned earlier, this is not my favorite section of the painting, but I'm working with it, I'm living with it and I'm not letting it get me down. Friends, are you having a good time? Hit the like button, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing, but let's keep moving on. Oh, I love this sleigh bell. Added a few dots to the bells with white, a few dots and dashes around the edge that kind of feel like stitching, gorgeous. Something I've been doing as I've gone along here, defining the greenery. I've been kind of loosely outlining areas of the greenery and further defining them as pine needles. So I'm loving the definition that that little detail is adding. So give it a try for sure. All right, friends, I am taking another step back, giving a view of this whole piece. And I feel like I need more uh, sash. I need more sash. I need uh, some tails to kind of go up and kind of curve around the the copper kettle. And so I'm doing just that, adding another loop and another few tails and just applying the same technique. There's nothing that says that you can't add some bold moments in your painting late in the game. And that's just what I'm doing here. It needed to happen. So I'm making it happen. Another detail that I've decided to add is a second tulip. It's a bold move at the end of the painting, but I felt like it needed it. My spring area here at the bottom, kind of left-hand side, didn't feel springy enough. So I'm adding another tulip. And of course, it's gonna be a little more of a bright fluorescent orange. A few more snowflakes. This is the point in the painting, friends. I want you to take a step back. Really want you to breathe. Breathe a few times. And I want you to just say, what? What are three things that I can add right now in the last five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, whenever it is when you decide to take that big few breaths? I want you to pick three, maximum five little strokes, details you can add, and then call it finished for today. You don't have to call it finished, period, but call it finished for today. Don't let yourself overwork like I'm overworking that area right now, up in the winter, I don't even need to say it for the love, but I, I actually, by the time I wrapped up, this is where I spent the last few minutes of my painting was in the silver white winter section, yeah. Whew. But I actually worked it out by the end. But choose the last few brush strokes, get them down and just sit back and leave that painting, prop it up somewhere, admire it for a few days. And if you feel absolutely 100% like there's something you have to add or edit or change, then by all means do it, but don't do it today. I love this painting so much and I would have missed out. I, I, honestly, I stressed about doing this painting because there's two ways that I could have done it. I could have done it like crazy particular super hyper focused, taken hours and hours and hours, and it would have been a whole lot more perfect than it is right now. But that would have come with a tremendous amount of stress, most likely, honestly, it would have because I was stressed about even starting at all. And that's the point of today. Really, that's the point of today for you to take back some time for you to dive into something that feels bigger than you on this art journey, knowing that you can skip through it. You can wander through it and you 
can produce something incredible without being a perfectionist at every step of the way. What you created today is gorgeous. It's not perfect. It's not anywhere near perfect. You could pick it apart if you wanted to, but you're not going to, right? Thank you so much for painting with me. This has been incredible. This has been an honor to paint this with you. If you've just been watching along, I hope you do give it a try. Even if you try one or two or three elements, how about that, that copper kettle? That was my favorite. And the rose and the bow, the sash. Oh, it was a good time. Thanks, friends. <laughs>